Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. China has hosted a dialogue near Arunachal Pradesh. India's neighbors were present, India was not. And it is here that Beijing issued a message to New Delhi. The border situation will not improve. Instead, China is lecturing India on sovereignty. We'll tell you what they're up to and how New Delhi is responding. Meanwhile, in the US, Biden is building Trump's border wall. When he took office, he said he won't build a foot of it. Now he's adding more than 30 kilometers. India's central bank has issued a new policy. It talks about bonds. It is hawkish and it shows that inflation remains a big worry. In Canada, Justin Trudeau has been heckled on the streets as his diplomats begin leaving India. Putin has praised Prime Minister Modi and issued a warning to the West. We'll tell you all about it. Ukraine's funding from the US is frozen and Taiwan is worried about this. We'll explain. Syria has launched a fresh offensive after 89 people were killed in the terror attack at a military academy. And the story of a Nobel Prize winner who flunked a college exam. It's a lesson for all of us. The headlines first. In the Philippines, a bomb threat sparks a security alert at 42 airports. Police patrols and sniffer dogs deployed. The country's aviation regulator received a bomb threat against commercial planes. It's the second such threat this week. Did Imran Khan plan attacks on military installations? His aide Usman Dar claims Imran Khan masterminded the 9th May violence to remove the army chief. Former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan was arrested in the month of May, following which PTI workers vandalized military buildings, including the army headquarters and the ISI building. Belgium is monitoring China's Alibaba over fears of spying. Alibaba's main logistics hub in Europe is under the scanner. The Chinese tech giant denies any foul play. In 2018, Alibaba signed an agreement with Belgium to open Europe's fifth largest cargo airport. In September, global sugar, sugar prices hit a 13-year high due to El Nino. The sugar price index jumped by almost 10% compared to August, the highest since November 2010. India and Thailand were the worst hit. El Nino refers to the warming of surface water in the Pacific Ocean. Jailed Iranian activist and journalist Nargis Mohammadi wins the Nobel Peace Prize for her fight against women's oppression in Iran. In the last two decades, she's been in and out of jail. She's campaigned against the hijab and the death penalty. Currently, she's serving multiple sentences amounting to 12 years. An Indian men's hockey team win gold at the Asian Games. India thrashed Japan 5-1 in the finals. With this win, India have now qualified for the 2024 Paris Olympics. Tonight, we lead with China. It's back to its old tricks, and if I may add, it's a fit candidate for Ripley's Believe It or Not. This is what Beijing did. First, it claimed that there is a consensus on the border. Then it hosted an event near the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh, and then China lectured the world on sovereignty. Leading the charge was their top diplomat, Foreign Minister Wang Yi. He says countries should respect territorial integrity. Couldn't agree more. He should tell this to his boss. Why does Xi Jinping not respect India's sovereignty? Of course, he did not talk about it. But the whole point of the speech was to send a message. China is not withdrawing troops. That is the message. It is giving lectures instead. So the border situation is not likely to improve soon. Wang Yi did not name India, but his choice of venue and words made it obvious. China's foreign minister was in Tibet at a place called Ningchi. Ningchi is barely 160 kilometers from the border with India, from India's Arunachal Pradesh. And what was China doing there? Holding talks with neighbors. They called it the third Trans-Himalayan Dialogue. Except India, all key neighbors of China participated in the dialogue. The attendees included Nepal, Pakistan, Afghanistan and Mongolia. All these countries sent their officials. Did New Delhi get an invite for this? Well, we don't know. But India has never participated at this forum. The previous two dialogues happened in 2018 and 2019. India was not there. And even if Beijing were to ask nicely, New Delhi had no reason to show up. Because Ningchi has history. 
It is the hub for provocations related to India. It is strategically located right next to the Indian border. Ningchi is an old military town. But in recent years, it has gained more importance. The Chinese military is adding assets here. The PLA keeps its mountain brigades in this town and experts say Beijing is building more infrastructure here. It is adding highways and rail facilities. It is upgrading airports. Let me give you an example. In 2021, China completed a road and tunnel system. It connected Ningchi to Medong County. Medong County is a remote area, but it sits on the India-China border. And Beijing has been building more roads and tunnels like these. The idea is to reduce travel time to improve connectivity from Chinese bases to the border with India. In fact, I have some numbers. Earlier, the distance from Ningchi to the border was more than 300 kilometers. But with the new roads and tunnels, it is almost half to less than 180 kilometers. Travel time has been reduced by eight hours. Recently, Xi Jinping visited this region, to Ningchi in particular, and he praised the border guard battalion here. The Chinese president said they're doing a quote-unquote great job in guarding the border region. So when Wang Yi talks about the border, he's obviously sending a message to Delhi. We have his full statement. And this is what he said. We must adhere to mutual respect and trust, jointly maintain regional unity and respect each other's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Now, if you followed recent events, you know what Beijing is getting at. China claims almost the entire state of Arunachal Pradesh. They say it's theirs. And this claim has no basis in history or fact. The international community does not recognize China's claims, but Beijing still chooses to assert them. And recently, it has doubled down. In the month of April, the Chinese government released a list. It assigned Chinese names to areas in Arunachal Pradesh, and this was not a first. Beijing marks some territories in Arunachal and gives them what it calls standardized names. It has released three such lists so far, at least three. In 2017, in 2021, and then again in 2023, this year. And renaming territories is just one tactic. Beijing also releases incorrect maps. The latest one came in August. It showed Arunachal Pradesh with, within China's borders. They call it South Tibet. And the third tactic is to issue staple visas. Beijing does it for Indians from certain regions like Kashmir and Arunachal. It's their way of conveying that these are not Indian territories. Before the Asian Games, China targeted athletes from Arunachal. They were given staple visa, so they could not compete in the Games. And they did the same in July. India protested on both occasions, but China refused to change course. China doesn't recognize the so-called Arunachal Pradesh province you mentioned. The southern Tibetan region is part of China's territory. And now we have Wang Yi's statement. The message for New Delhi is clear. Expect more... More of the same from Beijing. Three years ago, China escalated border tensions in Ladakh and now it is exerting pressure in Arunachal. India is preparing to counter the PLA on all these fronts. Last month, India sanctioned new posts. These are called Border Intelligence Posts or BIPs. They're meant to monitor the border, track the military buildup and the transgressions, if any. These posts are manned by intelligence officials and they're drawn from different services like the Army, the Indo-Tibetan Border Police, the Intelligence Bureau, IB, and the Research and Analysis Wing, or RAW. The exact number of these posts has been kept a secret for obvious reasons. But here's what we know. Each post will have four to five officers on duty. They'll be stationed along the line of actual control, the de facto border between India and China. And their job will be to observe and report. India is also making a major push in border infrastructure. And Infra and Intel are both critical if New Delhi wants to counter China. Wang Yi's statement only reinforces the need for such efforts. U-turns and politicians, it's a story that never gets old. And the latest plot involves U.S. President Joe Biden. He promises, his promises rather from 2020 are coming back to haunt him. Why? Because he's breaking them. Biden's predecessor was Donald Trump. He came to power promising to build a wall between the U.S. and Mexico. That was a solution to immigration, a border wall. Build a wall, keep the migrants out. But in 2020, Biden opposed it. He said under his presidency, not a single foot of the wall will be built. Listen to this. 
There will not be another foot of wall constructed on my administration. Guess what? Biden is building a lot more than just a foot. He is building 32 kilometers of the same border wall. That's right. Biden is building Trump's wall. The question is why? If you ask the president, it's all technical. The money for this construction had been approved in 2019. Donald Trump was president then. Biden asked the Congress to channel this money elsewhere, but the Congress said no. So legally, Biden had to build the wall. Listen to his defense. I tried to get them to reappropriate, to redirect that money. They didn't. They wouldn't. And in the meantime, there's nothing under the law other than they have to use the money for what was appropriate. I can't stop that. Do you believe the border wall works? No. So Biden doesn't believe the wall will work, but he is building 32 kilometers of it anyway. That's American politics for you. It's amazing, really. Everything that goes wrong is the Congress's fault. Abortion rights, gun violence, funding for Ukraine, it's all because of the Congress. Why then is Joe Biden president? He himself promised to work across the aisle, to strike consensus with Republicans, and now he's putting all the blame on the Congress. It's a neat strategy. Wall or not, Biden is responsible for America's you, border you, situation. Let's take a look at some numbers. In 2019, around 850,000 migrants were apprehended at the border. 8,50,000. That's before Biden took office. In 2021, it was 1.7 million. In 2022, it was 2.2 million. And this year, it's already crossed 2 million. What happens to these people? Some of them are deported, others leave voluntarily, and the rest apply for asylum. More than 2 million asylum requests are pending before the U.S. government. It's basically an endless wait. Reports say around 11 million illegal migrants already live in the U.S. Some of them have been around for decades. So the border situation is a huge worry. Around 54% of American voters agree they think immigration is making life harder for native-born Americans. There is a partisan split, though. Around 73% Republicans versus around 37% Democrats. Both sides are panning Biden for his U-turn. Democrats say, this wall is a cruel solution. Republicans say, we told you so. And Donald Trump is leading that, that chorus. He's asking Joe Biden to apologize for rubbishing his wall. And chances are, Trump will face off against Biden next year in the presidential election. He's the frontrunner for president, the Republican frontrunner. And turns out, maybe even House Speaker. This week, the U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy was ousted. The Republicans cannot decide who to appoint next. Apparently, Trump's name has been proposed, sort of like a consensus candidate. But will the former president accept? Listen to his statement. This is what he said. They have asked me if I would take it for a short period of time for the party until they come to a conclusion. I will do it if necessary, should they not be able to make their decision. So Donald Trump is up for it. Unfortunately, the rule book is not. For starters, Trump is not a member of the Congress. But let's assume some MAGA fanboy vacates his seat. Trump then runs and enters Congress. Even then, he faces a hurdle. House Republicans are required to vacate their seats if charged with serious offenses. You don't have to be convicted. Simply being charged is enough to disqualify you. So Trump cannot hold a seat of Congress, not unless Republicans change the rules, or of course, unless Trump is declared innocent. But chances are all of this will take a lot of time. Trump faces 91 felony counts across two states. It's not Imran Khan level, but it's still a lot. You have to feel for the U.S. voters then. Their choice next year could be between these two men. Both are old and white. One is knee-deep in criminal and civil trials. The other is stumbling from one U-turn to the next. Here in India, the central bank has dropped a surprise. That's the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India. Today, its monetary policy was announced. Most of it was along expect expected lines. There was no change in the interest rates. The interest rates will stay at 6.5%. So your loans and your EMIs will cost the same. Does this mean inflation has largely been controlled? Well, not really. It means the RBI is changing its strategy. Instead of interest rates, they're using something else. 
bonds. Listen to Governor Shakti Kantadas. Declining core inflation is a silver line, but headline CPI inflation remains vulnerable to recurring and overlapping food price shocks. It's emphatically reiterated that the inflation target is 4% and not 2 to 6%. OMO sales will be undertaken as necessary. OMO sales will be done when necessary. That's the statement that has captured everyone's interest. So what exactly is OMO? It stands for Open Market Operations, OMO. Say the RBI sells government bonds in the open market. That's OMO. If they buy government bonds, it's the same. So what's the RBI doing now? They're planning to sell government bonds when necessary. The idea is to soak up li liquidity. Let me explain how this works. Suppose the RBI thinks there is too much liquidity in the economy. Maybe the banks have too much money lying around. As a result, inflation is creeping up. Then the RBI will sell government bonds. And who will buy them? Banks or corporations or mutual funds. They buy bonds. And these purchases will take money out of the economy. So liquidity down, inflation down. That's the RBI's game plan here. And just to be clear, the central bank has already been doing this. They've been selling bonds in the open market to drain liquidity. In September, they sold bonds worth $853 million. That's around 7,100 crore rupees. So how is this announcement different? Because these bond sales will be done via an auction process. I know it sounds complicated, but the RBI basically is giving us a message. The message is this. The threat of inflation has not disappeared. A couple of reasons for that. Number one, the poor rains. India has recorded its weakest monsoon in five years. Consider the June to September period. Rainfall was 6% less than average. And when the monsoon fails, India's crops fail, which means food inflation, food prices go up. In August this year, overall inflation was 6.8%. But food prices were up close to 10%. Do you know what that means? Food prices could drag inflation up. And that's a worry. Reason number two is fuel. Saudi Arabia and Russia are cutting oil output. They want to keep oil prices up. The government too is aware of this problem. Recently, India's petroleum minister issued an appeal. He asked oil producing nations to show sensitivity. In other words, to cut prices. And these two factors, food inflation and high oil prices, could worsen India's inflation. The RBI is aware of that, hence the bond sales. And how is the market responding? Sharply. Not many people saw this decision coming, plus the RBI did not give any details about the process. Like how much will they sell? Or when will they do it? And this lack of clarity has caught the market by surprise. The government's 10-year bond registered a sharp increase. In fact, its biggest single-day jump in 14 months. The yield was 7.2% in the previous session. It closed at more than 7.3% after the announcement. What does all of this mean for the Indian economy? It means that a tricky period is coming up. The growth is still expected to be robust. The World Bank projection is a GDP growth of 6.3%. So India will be among the fastest growing major economies in the world. The RBI's projection is also there about 6.5% for this financial year, 2023-24, 6.5%. But all these reports and agencies warn of one risk, and that is inflation. You just heard the RBI governor. He said inflation target is 4%, not 2 to 6%, 4%. So don't expect the RBI to ease off the pedal. Not even if inflation falls below 6%. Their policy is still hawkish, much like every country in the world right now. Take the United States, for instance. Their central bank has been increasing interest rates since March 2022. Last month, they paused. They held the interest rate steady, but that does not mean that the pain is over. America's central bank says one more rate hike is expected this year, and if that happens, it would be the 12th hike. A dozen interest hikes since 2022, so the economy is not out of the woods yet. Inflation remains a major problem. If prices rise out of control, there will be few further tightening. And if that happens, you can forget all the rosy GDP estimates. 
And now let's talk about Canada. Justin Trudeau is having a rough time. The criticism is mounting. He's facing it not just in Parliament but also on the streets of Canada. You have to look at this. Man. Why is that, sir? You f***ed up the entire country. You got our buddy over there. Yeah, but how, what, what, how, how did I mess up this country? Can anybody afford a home in this yes. day? He refused to shake his hand. Trudeau just cannot catch a break. This video has gone viral on social media. And in the real world, too, Justin Trudeau is getting no relief. Two weeks after his outburst, his team is busy pacifying India. This week, we witnessed a shift. Justin Trudeau changed his tone. He said he's not looking to escalate. His foreign minister did the same. She sought to engage with India, but privately. The hope was that this will reduce tensions. But India remains firm, and it is saying two things. Show us the proof and take your diplomats out of here. 41 of them. They've been asked to leave India, and they are leaving. The deadline is October 10, so less than five days to go. A new report says the Canadians have started leaving India. We don't have the numbers, but we're told most diplomats stationed outside Delhi have left. How many missions does Canada have in India? There's a high commission in New Delhi and three consulates in Bengaluru, Chandigarh and Mumbai. Now reports say the consulate staff has mostly left, a majority of them. That's what the Canadian press is saying. They're heading to two countries, Malaysia and Singapore. And more departures are expected in the days ahead. That's because India has asked for parity. India has 21 diplomats in Canada, but Canada had 62 diplomats in India. So for them to achieve parity, Ottawa will have to remove 41 of its people. Now we cannot say if they will remove 41, but it's evident that they are reducing their strength. How will this impact the visa process? Obviously it won't be business as usual. If you already have a visa, there's no reason for you to worry, you can travel. If you're applying or have applied, the waiting time may be longer. There's a lot of conversation around this. Also a lot of advice on what to do and what not to do. Some experts say you can travel to a third country and apply for a visa from there. You have to be really desperate to do that though. Canada is yet to share any contingency plans. Canadian universities are monitoring the situation closely. A new semester is about to begin. The students are worried. Reports say many of them are delaying enrollment. Some colleges are also offering alternatives like short-term courses. They're less expensive than a full-time degree. The idea is to keep the students engaged. They can complete a short course, which will be most likely online. And once they are done, and hopefully tensions ease, they can apply to join full-time. But the students are a worried lot. They're dealing with a lot of uncertainty. There are no timelines, and this is causing anxiety. Those who are already in Canada are worried about their safety. Last month, India had issued an advisory. It had asked Indian citizens, including students, to exercise caution to avoid certain areas. Now, Canadian universities are issuing statements of assurance, like the University of Toronto. Recently, it released a statement promising support to all Indian students. But that statement also made a candid admission. The university says, and I'm quoting, we do not have answers to many pressing questions. Maybe they should turn to their prime minister. He started this. He must find a way to end this. And cracking down on Khalistani terrorists would be a good place to begin. Our next story comes from Russia. Vladimir Putin cannot stop praising India. From hailing Make in India to calling the G20 summit Prime Minister Modi's personal success, the Russian president has been making such st statements through this year. The latest one came yesterday at the Valdai discussion group, discussion club rather. Vladimir Putin has delivered a keynote address there. It's an annual affair. He does it every year, usually with the same template. Panning the West, blaming NATO and praising Russia. But this year, Putin was singing praises for another country too, and that is India. Listen to this. India is the ancient global civilization. It's a huge civilization. It's a powerful civilization with uh, vast potential. As for the group of 20, that was a success of the Indian authorities and of Prime Minister Modi personally. That was a success. 
Well, that was Putin talking about India's G20 summit. India hosted the leaders' summit last month. Putin did not attend, but he's now calling it a success. He's lauding India for brokering consensus. Like I said, he's been praising India and its leadership for a while now. When I say you, I'm talking about our two countries who share very good and positive relations with Prime Minister Modi. He's a very wise man and India has been making great strides in its development under his leadership. In this regard, we should learn from many partners of ours, mainly our partners in India. They are mostly focusing on production and use of the cars and vessels produced in India. In this regard, Prime Minister Modi is doing the right thing by encouraging people to use the brand made in India. So why is the Russian president wooing India? Well, one reason is the historical ties. The second is the current political atmosphere. Tensions with the West are at an all-time high. Russia is under multiple sanctions. The world is under pressure to pick sides, but India has remained neutral. India has called for peace, and it hasn't stopped buying Russian oil. The West put a lot of pressure, but India refused to bow. And Russia and India are old partners. We have a long history of military cooperation. Russia is India's largest supplier of defense equipment, even though the sales have dropped. In the past decade, Russian arms sales to India have dropped by 65%. In 2022, it was worth $1.3 billion. Meanwhile, defense sales from the U.S. have jumped by 58%. Last year, it was worth $219 million. So it's still a very small figure compared to Russia. But the trend could have Putin worried. So while he's praising India, he's also issuing a warning, a warning for the West. He said, don't try to create a rift between India and Russia. They are trying to cast everyone who is not ready to blindly follow these Western elites as the enemy, anyone, China in certain situations. At a certain point in time, they tried to do the same with India. Now they are flirting, of course. We all understand this very well. We feel and see the situation in Asia. Everything is clear. I want to say that the Indian leadership is self-directed. It is led by the national interests. I think that those attempts make no sense. But praise for India aside, much of what Putin said was along predictable lines. He slammed the West for creating its own rules. He talked about Russia's mission to create a new world. And he defended the war in Ukraine. These three things stood out in his speech. The first was about nuclear warfare. Putin says Russia has successfully tested a nuclear-powered cruise missile. It's an experimental weapon known as Burovestnik. The NATO calls it Skyfall. Now, it is powered by a nuclear reactor. It is capable of carrying a nuclear warhead, and it is said to have unlimited range. But very little is known about its capabilities or the test that Putin is talking about. And here's something else that he said. He said that Russia could withdraw its ratification of the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Moscow last tested a nuclear weapon in 1990, when it was part of the Soviet Union. Now Putin is talking about pulling out of the treaty. Does that mean Russia will conduct a nuclear test? Here's what their president said. I am not ready now to say whether we should conduct nuclear tests or not. But to behave in a mirror way in relations with the United States, I repeat once again, they signed but did not ratify the International Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And we signed and ratified it. In principle, one can behave in a mirror way with the US. But this is a question for State Duma deputies. In theory, this ratification could be revoked. He also spoke about Yevgeny Prigozhin, the Wagner chief, the man who challenged Putin's leadership. In June, Prigozhin led an armed rebellion against Moscow. It was the first big threat to Putin's rule in two decades. But midway, Prigozhin stopped. He cracked a deal with the leadership. He was exiled to Belarus and now he's dead in a plane crash. All signs pointed at foul play by the Kremlin, but Putin suggests that the crash was caused by hand grenades detonating inside the plane. The director of the investigative committee reported recently to me that hand grenade fragments were found in bodies of those killed in the air accident. There was no external impact on the plane. That's the stated fact. That's the result of the expertise conducted by the investigative committee of the Russian Federation. Of course, these are Putin's claims. There is no evidence to prove them or to suggest otherwise. 
And then Putin talked about the war. He started it in February last year. Moscow expected Kiev to fall in three days. It's been 590 days and the capital still stands. It's now being called the forever war. And that's not, not necessarily a setback for Putin. The prolonged offensive is tiring the West. War fatigue has set in. The funding is drying and the morale is dipping. So while Putin may not be winning this war against NATO, he's not even losing it. So Putin said Ukraine is hanging by a thread. If Western aid to Kiev stops, so will the war. He said it wouldn't last a week. And the comments may hit a nerve because the U.S. has halted more funding to Ukraine. Kiev's biggest backer is not officially allowed to send more aid for the next 40 odd days at least. No American aid. Does this mean Putin's predictions will come true? Well, Biden and his European allies say they won't. They say that nothing will change in their support for Ukraine. But Zelensky will be nervous. And he's not the only one who's nervous. On the other side of the world, someone else is watching all of this very closely. Taiwan. Taiwan's situation mirrors that of Ukraine. And America's domestic politics blocking funds will have raised alarms there. It throws up the question. Can Taiwan rely on America if China invades? Here's our report. If one just stops it, it will all die in a week. The same applies to the defense system. Just imagine, the aid stops tomorrow. It will live only for a week, when they run out of ammo. So, the situation with the United States is dangerous. It does worry me, and, but I know there are a majority of members of the House and Senate in both parties who have said that they support funding Ukraine. With your, uh, I'm going to be announcing very shortly a major speech I'm going to make on this issue and why it's critically important for the United States and our allies that we keep our commitment. That is the latest round of developments in the Ukraine war in a nutshell. Putin says Ukraine won't last a week without aid. Zelensky is worried about the political situation in the US. And Biden is scrambling to find new ways to fund Kyiv. The US president is preparing a big speech to convince his country to send more money. He's also looking at alternative means of funding like using State Department grants. American officials reportedly think that Ukraine will falter if it doesn't get aid in a few weeks. It's a precarious situation, and how this plays out may affect more than just Ukraine's future. In the Pacific, another state with a dangerous neighbour is keenly watching all this unfold. Taiwan. When the war started, many people, just like the people here in Taiwan, uh, looking at the war taking place in front of them. They are watching uh, the videos of the war destructions and atrocities of this uh, uh, democracy called Ukraine. And then they look around and say, where is the next possible target of an authoritarian expansionism? And then they realize that Taiwan might be the next one. And they look at the Chinese uh, track record of a threatening Taiwan. Taiwan is self-governed and it wants to stay that way. China, however, wants the island in its grasp. In recent years, it has become increasingly aggressive around the Taiwan Strait. Beijing also refuses to rule out a military invasion to achieve what it calls reunification. So for Taiwan, the war in Ukraine is of great interest. It's a course on how to repel a larger, more powerful aggressor on how to survive in an asymmetric war. Ukraine was supposed to have fallen in days, but it's been about 20 months and Kyiv still stands. It has lost thousands of soldiers and territory along the way, but it continues to try and push Russia out. Even if it hasn't been too successful, Ukraine hasn't given up. The resistance has taught Taiwan a few crucial lessons. It has shown the effectiveness of the so-called porcupine strategy. Allow us to explain. A porcupine is a small and relatively harmless animal, not really a threat to anyone. But its body is covered in defensive quills. The quills make predators think twice before attacking it. Even if a porcupine is attacked, it hopes its quills will damage the attacker so much that the attacker lets go.
That's exactly the strategy Ukraine is using and the one Taiwan wants to perfect as well. Ukraine relies on small drones and handheld weapons to repel Russia, like the American HIMARS and Stingers and Javelins. Kyiv has made good use of these weapons to halt Moscow's advance. These are Ukraine's porcupine quills. But all these arms are from the West. Ukraine is in constant need of Western aid to continue its defence. Without the aid, Ukraine becomes a small, soft, defenceless target, which is why Taiwan will be worried with the American funding freeze. In the event of a war with China, Taiwan will be in the same situation completely dependent on Western military aid. Taipei doesn't have the capacity to forge more weapons than China. So, without Western and especially American supplies, Taiwan will eventually capitulate. The funding freeze in the US is a political ploy. It's not that the US is out of arms to give, but this proves that the US may not be the most reliable partner. Domestic concerns may handcuff Washington at a crucial hour. And where would that leave Taiwan? Well, as a quillless porcupine before a hungry dragon. If the US expects its allies to stand firm, it cannot keep wavering because of domestic issues. Because its domestic political instability will only serve to weaken Washington's friends abroad. More than any of these... Alliances are shifting in the Caucasus. Russia is on the brink of losing its longtime ally, Armenia. And guess who's replacing them? Russia's rival, Europe. Some background first here. Armenia's relations with Moscow are pretty old. It dates back to the 19th century. Later on, Armenia became part of the Soviet Union. So simply put, they're tight. Russia has supported and armed Armenia. In fact, they're part of the same treaty alliance. It's called the CSTO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization. Think of it as Russia's NATO. An attack on one CSTO member is an attack on all. Well, Armenia says it was attacked last month. Azerbaijan launched an operation into Nagorno-Karabakh. Now, technically, it's part of Azeri land, Nagorno-Karabakh. But until last month, it was ruled by Armenians, not the government, but by Armenian separatists. It was a tense and fragile peace. And Russia was supposed to hold this peace to guarantee the status quo. But when trouble came, Russia went missing. Azerbaijan rolled in and took over Nagorno-Karabakh. So now Armenia's government is looking for options. And in Europe, they have found a willing partner. On Thursday, EU leaders held a special summit with Armenia. Azerbaijan was also supposed to attend, but their president decided to skip. He said, Turkey is not coming, so I won't. Now a quick side note. Turkey is a key supporter of Azerbaijan. President Erdogan gives them political and military support. Back to the summit now in the EU. Armenia's Prime Minister met three European leaders, French President Emmanuel Macron, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, and EU President Charles Michel. Look at the statement after these meetings. This is what they said. The leaders underlined their unwavering support to the independence, sovereignty, territorial integrity, and inviolability of the borders of Armenia. In fact, Macron is extra keen. This week, he sent his foreign minister to Ar Armenia and he also promised them military support. The French president accused Azerbaijan of violating international laws. So it's not France that has a problem with Azerbaijan. It's Azerbaijan that has a problem today with the commitments it has made, with keeping its own word and with respecting international law. This commitment is very important. Because France is a NATO country, Armenia is Russia's treaty ally. So for them to take weapons from France is massive. But why is Macron so keen? Well, France is home to a large Armenian diaspora. Paris was among the first Western capitals to recognize the Armenian genocide. The US did so around two decades later. So France has always been interested in Armenia. But beyond all that, there is also a strategic reason. The chance to sway a Russian ally. You don't get that every day. And President Putin is making Macron's job easy. He's blaming Armenia for ignoring Russia's proposals. 
Armenia and Azerbaijan signed the statement. Do you understand? The statement in which Armenia confirms Nagorno-Karabakh as a part of Azerbaijan Republic. There are no Armenians left in Nagorno-Karabakh. Everyone left. Do you know that everyone left? There are just no Armenians. Maybe 1,000 or one and a half thousand. That's it. And that's not what Armenia wants to hear. Certainly not from its ally. But compare that to Europe. They're giving Armenia weapons. They've also invited their prime minister to address the EU parliament. So Brussels is ticking all the boxes. And how has Armenia responded? With equal enthusiasm. Their parliament has voted to join the ICC, that's the International Criminal Court, the same court which has issued an arrest warrant for Putin. So Armenia is not holding back. They are unhappy with Moscow and they are making it known. Where does that leave Vladimir Putin? In a tight spot. The Caucasus is supposed to be Russia's backyard, yet their dominance has been questioned. I am sure other former Soviet states will also be watching what's happening like the five stands in Central Asia. Will they trust Russia's security umbrella anymore? Or will they look for alternatives? China, for example, is very eager to jump in. The US and Europe have also been making moves in Central Asia. So what's happening in the Caucasus has long-term strategic impacts. It could change the traditional perception about Russia. They're usually seen as a reliable partner, someone who turns up all the time. But after Armenia, maybe not. And now let's turn our attention to nearby West Asia. Syria is once again in mourning. Its government just saw one of its deadliest attacks in years. Yesterday, a drone strike took place at a military academy. It was during a military graduation ceremony. At least 89 people have been killed. More than 270 are injured. Newly graduated troops and their families are among the victims. And Syria's defense minister barely escaped. He left the venue just minutes before the drone strike. Damascus blames terrorists for this attack. And it has begun to retaliate. The Syrian government is bombarding rebel-held territory in the country's northwest. This risks reigniting a conflict that has been relatively calm for about three years. Here's a report. Yesterday was supposed to be a day of celebration. A graduation ceremony was taking place in the city of Homs in western Syria. Newly minted soldiers preparing to join the army of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Their parents were there to see them march about in their brand new uniforms. But before they could join Assad's long war, the war came to them. A drone attack wreaked havoc at the academy. Dozens of new troops and their family members were killed. I was taking pictures with my family. They were happy with my graduation. Suddenly we were just on the ground, not knowing what happened. May God not guide them. They broke my back. I only had one brother and no one else. We were out and my brother was graduating. We were standing with him. We took a few pictures and we thought to leave and we didn't see anything after that, other than people on the ground. I don't know what happened then. I just felt fire in my face and everything was ripped apart. There were so many people and I don't know what happened to them. Syrian officials say at least 89 people have been killed. This includes 31 women and 5 children. 277 people were injured in the strike. This was the deadliest attack on Syrian government forces in years. A mass funeral was held today. It was attended by Syria's defense minister, who barely avoided becoming a victim himself. Reports say he left the academy mere minutes before the attack. He returned to offer his condolences and give a morale-rousing speech. The dignity and prosperity of a nation has a high price and the biggest value someone can give to his nation is to offer his life. For those martyrs who gave their lives for the nation, of course the price of their blood is very valuable but the nation is more so and we need to make sacrifices for the benefit of the nation. So who was behind this drone strike? No one has claimed responsibility. 
but Damascus has blamed terrorist groups backed by known international forces. It did not elaborate further, but it has begun its revenge. The Syrian regime has started attacking the rebel-held region of Idlib. The attacks began yesterday and are ongoing. There have been reports of civilian casualties. There was a bombing at 11 o'clock at night on the city of Dare Izza, and shortly after casualties began arriving at our hospital. The number of injuries was 15 to 20, including critical cases. We transferred two or three cases to the surgical department. Idlib is to the north of the city of Homs, and it's one of the last places controlled by anti-Assad rebels. There's been a tenuous peace in the region for the last three years. A ceasefire was brokered by Russia and Turkey in March 2020. That brought an end to some of the worst fighting in Syria. But that fragile calm seems to have shattered. Idlib is in the government's crosshairs once again. The Syrian civil war is in its 13th year. It began in 2011 with pro-democracy protests against President Bashar al-Assad. He responded with brutality, sparking the conflict. The war has taken over half a million lives. It has left about 13 million people displaced. The latest attack and the government's retaliation risk reopening the wounds of war. Unless cooler heads prevail, Syria may erupt in violence once again. You always pass failure on your way to success. This is a famous quote and it rings true for 62-year-old Mungi Bawendi. He's a professor at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This week he won the Nobel Prize. He's the co-winner of the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. He got it for developing what are called quantum dots. These are nanoparticles. They illuminate when exposed to light. Bawendi's work has made our television screens brighter. It has made the treatment of liver disease more effective. But that's not the story we are telling you tonight. Bawendi is a brilliant mind, no doubt, but he did not get here without his fair share of setbacks. Throughout school, he excelled in science. He aced exams without breaking a sweat. So he made it to the Harvard University. But what happened next was a rude awakening for him. He flunked his very first chemistry test. Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, he flunked his college chemistry test. He got an F, the lowest grade in his entire class. He was devastated. He says the experience nearly destroyed him. You see, this man loved chemistry. He thoroughly enjoyed it. But he says he never learned the art of preparing for an exam. When he failed, he worked on it and he bounced back. And now he's won the Nobel Prize in the very same subject. Bawendi says this experience taught him a lesson. It showed him the value of perseverance. His story is inspirational. It's a story for everyone, for all of us. After all, who doesn't fail? We've all been there. Most of us have tanked a test, flopped on a big presentation, or failed a diet. Reports say 92% of people do not achieve their goals. 80% people fail their New Year's resolution by February. And I'm not trying to depress you here. I'm merely saying that failure is a shared experience. It is pervasive. It even has its own dedicated day, by the way. The International Day of Failure is October the 13th. And its own museum. The Museum of Failure. It's in Sweden. Most of us would love to visit this museum, even get a good laugh out of it. Yet we try our best to avoid failure. We fear it. In fact, the fear of failure tops the list of phobias the world over. 31% people suffer from it, from the fear of failure. That's one in every three people. Do you know how many people fear the paranormal? 15%. So people would much rather get gobbled up by ghosts than take a maths test. And the fear of failure haunts all age groups. Research says many college students fear public speaking more than death. And for 90% CEOs, the fear of failure is their biggest concern. Failure haunts people across countries too. More than half of Australians fear failure. It's according to a survey in America. This fear has been rising since the past two decades. The same fear drove more than 13,000 Indian students to suicide in 2021. And the situation is so bad in South Korea that their government is holding campaigns to help people overcome the fear. 
The question is, why are so many people scared to mess up? For starters, it's the education system, where the, where the ultimate goal is to simply pass exams and not to learn. Failure equals being a loser. Research says overprotective parents are also at fault. In fact, Gen Z has a name for them, snowplow parents. They build a clear, perfect path to success for their child, shielding them from small risks and big failures. And on top of this, social media does not help. It turns every slip up into an extinction level cancellation affair. The truth is none of this helps. Study after study says that failure is necessary. You usually have to fail to succeed. Apple co-founder Steve Jobs was fired from his own company. During his period of exile, he picked up a small graphics company. Later it was named Pixar Animation Studios. He made Steve Jobs a billionaire. Michael Jordan was dropped from his high school basketball team. Today, he's called the GOAT. Early on, Oprah Winfrey was fired from her job as a TV news anchor. Today, she is one of the greatest TV personalities in the world. Amitabh Bachchan was rejected from a radio job because of his voice. Today, the Indian star actor is known for it. My point is, no one simply emerges at the top. Anyone with a resume of accomplishments has a resume of failures and humiliations too. The fear of failure is important, yes, especially for people with dangerous jobs like paratroopers or bomb diffusers, because for them, failure can have dire consequences. It's the difference between life and death. So how do they, much like anyone, tame their fear? By tapping into their reserves of courage. After all, to fail is human, but to rebuild oneself after it is an act of courage. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Western Europe's highest peak, Mont Blanc, is shrinking as warmer summers melt snow peaks. In Argentina, Cirque du Soleil opens its new show in honor of football superstar Lionel Messi. And in Russia, two young snow leopards found a new toy as they played with a camera trap hidden to film them. And finally, we're taking you back in history on this day. In 1973, war erupted in West Asia. Egypt and Syria launched a surprise attack on Israel during the Yom Kippur holiday. After three weeks of fighting, an Egyptian-Israeli ceasefire was secured by the United Nations. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. Ukrainian officials have